thank you all for coming and really want to share the, the brilliance of this team that's taught me a lot about life saving of cats with FELV and every other kind of thing that makes them vulnerable. Uh, this is the team that really hasn't met any cat they can't save. So I do learn from them too. And so, but I'm gonna start with a, a brief review focused on FELV from the veterinary side. So we had a, a more in-depth session earlier in the week, but now I'm gonna talk about um, some of the friction between rescue and shelter and veterinarians, because I know that can be a pain point that we need to work on. And then we're going to hijack the session a little bit to talk about some uh, developments in treatment of cats with FIP. And also just to kind of bring everybody up to date on what's going on with the Chinese coronavirus and its incursion into the US and what that might mean for shelter workers. So the first thing that uh, people can uh, ask questions about is um, how can my vet learn best testing protocols? We know that a lot of times the, the cat rescue folks and the cat sheltering people are really like staying up to date. They're hungry for that new information that's coming out. They're coming to these conferences, reading the latest articles, but their private practice veterinarian may not be as up to date as they are because the veterinarians have a lot more content to keep up with. And sometimes they're just not going to the meetings where this is discussed. So the um, important thing to know is the American Association of Feline Practitioners in January of this year released a new edition of the testing guidelines. And so this really is the law of the land. This is the expert opinion. It was international experts that put this together. It is 26 pages of meticulously documented FELV and FIV information that talks about how to diagnose, vaccinate, pre uh, prevent spread, treat, and adopt. And it's a very shelter-friendly document now and really encouraging adoption of these cats instead of um, just segregation or euthanasia. So this is available for free at the website of the American Association of Feline Practitioners. It's called um, catvets.com. So you just download it and share it with all your veterinarians. It should be very helpful. Just to dive into it a little bit is this is the, what we're recommending now if you're going to be testing cats. And that is, I think a lot of shelters should be considering if they're testing cats, a one and done protocol. And we'll talk a little bit about why it can become very complicated if you start running a whole lot of confirmatory tests. So point of care screening, the SNAP test is the best combo test that's out there. So I prefer that brand if, you're, um, if you are going to test. And if the cats are positive, you can just accept they're infected, or if they're negative, accept they're uninfected. Are you gonna be right 100% of the time? No, you're not. You're gonna misdiagnose some cats, but the risk of that is not the same as it used to be, because it used to be very common that we would just euthanize all the positive cats. So it was really essential to try and, and make sure they were positive, but we really should just leave that behind and commit to placing all the positive cats in homes. Um, if you are keeping cats as blood donors, so if anybody's working in a, a veterinary practice or uh, if you, your cat is the blood donor that always comes in, really should PCR those cats be, uh, to make sure they're uninfected because even if they are very, um, have very low levels that we can't detect, they can spread that via a blood transfusion. But for this audience, that's probably not that common. But if you do have a cat that you want to dive into confirmation, this is where the new test that we're doing now is a PCR test. It's so much more simplified. We're really gonna let go of IFA testing, testing with different brands, and all of the other ways that we could look at trying to confirm an initial positive test and just go for that PCR test. We're currently recommending the IDEX lab over all the others because they are actually giving us a quantitative test. So we can tell if a cat has regressive infection or progressive infection. And the only time we really recommend retesting negative cats is if they come from a very high risk background. So that might be a cat that comes in with an abscess and clearly he was bitten by another cat in the recent past and they, if they were infected, they might not be showing it yet. Or in uh, special situations like hoarding cases where they have a lot of FELV or FIV in it, we'll probably hold those cats and test them again. So what, how can uh, I teach my local veterinarian about the new staging that's available? And this is really what's new. This comes out of three years of research in conjunction with Awesome Pets Alive and their FELV adoption program. We were very fortunate to have a big long-term study funded by Maddie's Fund 
we enrolled 130 FELV positive cats and we tested them with a massive panel of tests every month for six months. And our goal was to say, if we test with all of the available tests, maybe at the end we'll be able to tell you what the best test is and really clarify how to test. And for FELV, it turns out we just turned up more questions than we really answered. But when we, we dug into it longer, we actually were able to sort the cats out into these categories. And one is, so if the cat is positive on that screening test, and then you submit to IDEX for this FELV panel, they're gonna do another antigen test, it's a different kind of antigen test, and then this quantitative PCR. And if both of those are negative, we can determine that that cat most likely has abortive infection, which means they fought off the infection, at least as far as we can tell. Remember, we're only looking at the blood, we're not looking at all the tissues where the virus could still be um, hiding, but that's probably not the most common outcome. In the red, we see the classic, what you think about with FELV is progressive infection. They are positive on their antigen tests, they are high positive on their PCR tests, and these are the cats that are likely to develop FELV-associated disease and have a shorter lifespan on average. Now remember, that's on average, and we all have seen some progressively infected cats that just live very healthy lives for a long time. And then the most interesting thing is this regressive population. These are cats that have low level of PCR, or they might even be negative on PCR, but still positive on antigen, or vice versa. So these are cats that are largely controlling their virus. They're not eliminating it, but they're keeping it very low. And some days when we test, we can detect the virus, and some days we can't detect it. These cats, as far as we know, are more likely to live a normal lifespan, less likely to infect other cats or develop disease. Now know that this is new data, and we haven't followed very many cats over the lifetime. We're three years into following this group of cats, so check back in 10 years, and we'll have a much, <laughs> much more clear answer. But we can give you a sneak peek. It's not published yet. This is the outcome um, so far of following these cats for three years. This is a survival curve. And so those lines represent what proportion of cats are still alive over time. And that's a three-year time scale. So those cats that we determined with these new testing panels to be abortive, all of those cats are still alive three years later. The cats that had regressive infection, we know they're infected, but at this low level, 80% of those cats are still alive. But then look at the cats that have progressive infection. Over half of those cats have died within three years. So it used to be, we, we kind of are doom and gloom about all of the cats with FELV, but now with this new staging information that anybody can run at the diagnostic lab, you can really start to separate out cats and give them a different prognosis. All right, my next topic is how can my vet relax about FIV positive cats? We were just talking about this with a, a shelter that is uh, not allowed to adopt out their FIV positive cats yet. And I think the, the shelter community really is ahead of the game on this. A lot of you have become aware of the papers that show that cats that do not fight, if they're, they're neutered and they get along, they're, they really don't spread it within a household. So we have become much more comfortable adopting out cats with FIV into a household with negative cats, or even not testing for FIV in our shelter and still grouping cats together in group housing that we um, don't know their status. And this is a landmark paper that Dr. Litzter did that followed cats over five years in a sanctuary that mixed their cats and there was no transmission of FIV. So we are really comfortable now letting FIV cats live with other cats, but understand this is not the case for FELV. FELV is still transmitted among cats that get along. And I love the description someone um, described to me recently that said, FIV is a disease that you share with your enemies because they, they spread it by biting, and FELV is a disease you share with your friends because living close together is, is how it's spread. How can I help my vet embrace decision, our decision to cut back on shelter testing? This is really, I think, where we're, we're the biggest pain point that we're feeling and the most controversy and resistance among private practice veterinarians to um, understand this general shift of testing, to cut back on testing in shelters where cats are adopted and to transfer that testing to private veterinarians post-adoption where they receive their lifelong care. And we have decades of culture where shelters were screening all of the cats and then adopting them out um, with a known status. And now we are saying we're gonna repurpose 
those costs that we were investing in testing and into other life-saving activities, and we are going to ask people to get the cats tested at their new veterinarian. And so this is, uh, the new veterinarians aren't really prepared for this, and if we don't do a good job talking to them in our community before we unleash this new policy, it can catch them by surprise and put them in a difficult situation. The good news is the guidelines from the feline practitioners address this, and it is a wave that we are seeing. It is the future, but it's up to us to make sure we maintain really good communication with our local veterinary community. Because the last thing we want is someone to adopt a cat, gets tested at the veterinarian, and then they're told they have to euthanize a cat if it's positive, which we know can happen. So in general, shelters are still testing cats that are high risk. So they might be cats that are sick or that have a, a history of high risk exposure. They may also um, be testing to avoid in-clinic spread. So we would look at that. We should test cats for FELV before we put them in group housing, because we don't want to mix up FELV positive cats with negative cats. Um, some shelters are also saying, well, before I do a $3,000 surgery, I'm going to test them for FELV, if that would make a difference. And sometimes we test them in legal cases. So if we're doing hoarding cases and we need a really good exam, full assessment of the animal, we might test those cats. We need to up our game as far as improving communication with the veterinary community. And adopters really need to understand what they have and have not um, re received in the shelter. And I think this is hard for us because we know that adopters aren't really listening to us, right? When we're doing that adoption counseling, they picked out their kitten. That's all they're thinking about. They're sort of daydreaming about stopping at PetSmart on the way home. And we're giving them all this information, and we might give them handouts about what to do, including saying, don't mix your cat up with your, your new cat, with your old cat, until you, you have a vet visit to make sure they're healthy and they get tested. And it goes right over their head, and they don't do it, right? And so uh, we need to make sure our communication with the adopters is better, and then really connect with the uh, veterinarians so they know what their next step is going to be. This is how one uh, shelter in Canada handed, handled it. They made a really good handout explaining uh, what the change was when they decreased testing and what it meant for the veterinarians. And they met with the veterinarians long before they rolled this change out. So it actually went quite smoothly, and they did not have complaints from the veterinarians. And then finally, how can I help my vet embrace FELV positive cat adoption? So FI, FIV is not as uh, much of a a concern for um, health and for longevity. And so that's usually the first barrier that comes down as shelters start adopting out the FIV positive cats. But then FELV sounds a little bit scarier, and it certainly is scarier to veterinarians as well. And so this is where some great work that the team at Austin Pets Alive have done. They actually did follow-up owner satisfaction surveys with people who got their FELV positive cats, and they were amazingly positive about it. And I think this is a credit to the education and support that the program offers to these folks. But just remarkably to me is that the vast majority of people who adopted one cat said they would do it again, that the experience was very positive for them. So sharing this with veterinarians, that our adopters are happy with their cats, as long as we give them good education, I think really helps relieve a lot of that anxiety. This is a, just a a press release that came out of a shelter that uh, it's um, in Chicago, a cat shelter, and they, as many programs do start, this was some foster kittens that were super cute, and when they came back to be tested, they were positive, and the protocol had been to euthanize kittens in the past, but that would have caused a lot of drama with the foster home, and they said, well, let's, let's give it a try. Let's adopt them out, and it was huge success. And so they actually, that kicked off their whole adoption program. They've got great uh, materials now that they share with their adopters and with their local veterinarians. And it was so successful, and they had a cat cafe that they had built in their new shelter. And so they actually made the cat cafe the FELV positive cat cafe. So now the FELV cats have the prime real estate in the whole shelter. And if you want to have a great experience in that shelter hanging out, you're going to be hanging out with the FELV cats. So great idea for promoting cats. And then this, I just love this quote from Maddie's fund, uh, Dr. Sheila Segerson, uh, that kind of concluded when they saw all the results of this research that they'd been supporting, was that people are adopting these cats, loving them, and not regretting it. And this 
is definitely our experience, and it's one that you can have as well. So now, that's my whirlwind tour of the world of FELV and FIV. I'm going to shift gears and talk a little bit about a treatment for FIP, which is not on the agenda, but it is something that everybody's talking about because it's a recent development. And just a warning, the next picture is sad, so if you want to just look away. Um, when I look at this, it just breaks my heart. But this is um, from a group that is um, a huge Facebook group where people who are treating their cats for FIP share their stories. And this, uh, she's from Germany or Romania, I remember it's an international group, and they had gotten this, this kitten, uh, Kiki, that they loved, and Kiki liked to ride around in the basket uh, on the bike. And then Kiki developed FIP and died very quickly. And this is a disease that primarily affects kittens and, and young cats in the prime of their life. And so these images that you're seeing here are of the cat's funeral and the heartbreak that this family had of losing this cat. And that is what we thought was, that was always the case. There was nothing we could do for FIP. And now there is an antiviral drug and it is not approved for any species. So, but it is, um, it has been used experimentally. It's showing a lot of promise for treating people with Ebola and it is now experimentally being used for people with uh, Chinese coronavirus. And so, but it was, a, it was, tried by UC Davis in cats with FIP, and a great number of these cats were cured of FIP, which is a miracle as far as I am concerned. I've been, uh, I just turned 60, and for many decades, I looked at FIP as this hopeless, horrible disease, and it's so exciting to see this change. So what you see here in if, um, the Facebook group where these cats are displayed, you know, these cats, classic FIP, thin, dying, and miraculously within days of starting this treatment, they recover. The, um, and so there's a paper that published in the Feline Journal about this. And this is the sort of detail. It's, uh, the drug doesn't have a name. Um, it's, it's always got chemical numbers like this, GS. And the protocol, as far as we know now, what's being used is 84 days of daily treatment. There are, it's a pill form and an injection form. Incredibly expensive. And it's uh, with the Cost depends a little bit on where the drug is acquired as well as the size of the cat because it's dosed by weight. Um, it is, again, not approved in any species, which means when you're acquiring it, um, if you're getting it from China from these knockoff drug companies, we call it black market, gray market, unapproved. Um, it's, and you, you, know, you take your chances because you're not getting it from a reputable source. And there al already has been examples of fraudulent drug being sold. Um, but what is most amazing to me is this is not a, a veterinary-led movement. There is a group of cat owners that have been through this, this treatment. They have a web page called FIP Warriors that the folks, people with infected cats, join. And then these lay people who are very experienced and know more, have more experience than anyone else coach these cat owners through how to get it, um, they share the drug around, they share fundraising advice, and um, it's very typically after uh, uh, the 84 days of treatment, folks will have these little graduation parties for, you did, for, for um, the cats that make it. And then there's an 84-day waiting period afterwards to see if they're going to relapse. So um, this is just, you'll hear about this. Um, it may not really be accessible. Uh, to everyone because of the costs, and we don't even know what's going to happen with the drug supply because it's probably effective against the Chinese coronavirus, and so it may, um, we may see all the drug going to human use. This is another company. This is Mushin. This is a company in the U.S., and they have avoided the drug regulatory system simply by calling it a supplement. And it is a sad irony that if you're going to get a drug approved through FDA, it's a $10 million, five-year process. If you call it a supplement and make no claims, there's no regulation whatsoever. You can sell it over the counter. So that is what this company is doing. It is more expensive, but it is uh, in the states, and probably you can guarantee that you're actually getting active drug if you go through Mucin. And you can see thousands of people are doing this for their cats. This is the, the Facebook page, FIP Warriors. There's 15,000 people on it that are sharing their experiences treating cats. There is another page called FIP Warriors Veterinarians, 
for veterinarians. We do not recommend that veterinarians buy this drug and distribute it. So what the veterinarian should do is refer their clients to FIP Warriors page where they'll get the advice. And the veterinarians can just back up these people by doing lab work. And then finally, I'm going to wrap up with um, what we're all very worried about, especially when we're traveling and going through airports, is the novel coronavirus from China. This is a very severe, very infectious, 2% mortality rate in people. And we need to think at least a little bit about preparation for our shelters, uh, because what, what happens if um, the outbreak spreads across the country and half of your staff is sick and can't come in? What if it is shown to um, infect cats and dogs and now the public health people are concerned about what our shelters are doing? So make sure you keep track of uh, on the websites of like NACA, um, AAWA, HSUS, ASPCA, there's going to be some consensus statements that are developed in the next week or so and released and the shelter folks really need to keep up with what the public policy is going to be. This document um, from the WSAVA, the World Small Animal Veterinary Association, you can find on their website, is excellent and summarizes what we know now. And we don't want to cause panic too much by um, talking about what the risk could be, but already there is a dog in Hong Kong that has been reported. The owner had coronavirus, and so they tested the dog, and the, they found coronavirus in the dog. And they don't know if that was just contamination from being around the infected person or whether the dog is actually infectious. Um, dog's not sick, but could they shed virus to people? And if dogs and cats can shed virus to people, that's a problem. Also, dogs and cats do have their own strain of coronavirus which has nothing to do with this, does not infect people, but panic could confuse the public about coronavirus and dogs and cats and people. Um, the, in Hong Kong, they're actually quarantining the pets of people that are sick with coronavirus. And the CDC is saying, we don't really know yet what this is, but we suggest you not um, pet snuggle, kiss, lick, and share food with your pets at this time. And I do want to take a moment to encourage anybody who's not in the Million Cat Challenge to please join this campaign to save millions of cats in animal shelters. And to thank Maddie's Fund and everybody who supported this research and let us talk to you today for um, all of the advances that we're learning about FELV. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues Monica and Natasha, and they'll talk a little bit about their experience with act um, these life-saving programs. Thanks, Doc. So, right? My name is Monica Friend, and I'm the director of Feline Lifesaving at, at American Pets Alive, and I've been with Austin Pets Alive for well, too long. I'll date myself if I tell you. Um, I want to be sappy for a quick minute because as I sat up here and I watched Dr. Levy present this information and I looked at Natasha to my right, I would be really remiss if I didn't take this opportunity. Dr. Levy has been one of my personal heroes for 20 years now, and I don't think there is another woman on the planet who has done more to save the lives of cats. So please thank me, join me in thanking her for the incredibly voluminous research that she has put forward to save community cats, feral cats, FIV cats, you name it. Dr. Levy is a, a hero to every cat in this country right now. And then as I sat here looking at Natasha and Dr. Levy, this is the next generation of Dr. Levy right here. Natasha has been with us. I hired her as an adop off-site adoption counselor. How many years ago? Uh, a little over five. Five years ago. And Natasha gravitated immediately towards the unsavable. She wanted the hardest of the hard to adopt. And so she started with incontinent cats. And then she moved to feline leukemia cats. And she found her bread and butter. And Natasha has been our feline leukemia program manager for years now. And she has single-handedly adopted out more than 1,000 leukemia-positive cats. <laughs> Natasha is leaving Austin Pets Alive next week to finish her and to get in, she's going to going to be she's going to be a vet she's going to vet school and so she's going to come back to us into shelter medicine and she's going to be I said the next generation of Dr. Levy who's going to uh, keep advancing these amazing uh, the amazing work that Dr. Levy and her colleagues have started so um, I said I just wanted to be sappy for a moment because 
these guys are my heroes and I just have the opportunity to work with them. So um, I have led the CAT program at APA for, I don't know, too long. And when I first started, we were adopting out, I think we did like 25 cats with fetal leukemia a year that we would adopt out. And where we are now is almost 400 a year that we will adopt out. So we have the largest fetal leukemia program in the country, adoption program. Uh, we are not a sanctuary. We don't believe it should be a sanctuary. It is an adoption program. They don't need sanctuary. Um, and I'll let Natasha talk about it because she's the one actually doing the work. I just get the honor of <laughs> pretending to supervise her, um, which for a rock star like Natasha means you hire her and you set her free to do her amazing work. Um, so she's, she's, she's your, model, your model player and you can't hire her. <laughs> but um, so we'll do about 400 female leukemia adoptions this year. We're doing every study that Dr. Levy comes up with and we can possibly fund. We're, we're, we're continuing those studies. Um, Natasha, I'm also going to tell you is wildly passionate about FIP. She is an FIP warrior. She can answer your FIP questions as well. Um, I said it's just my honor to get to work with both of them. So I'm able to help you all set up your programs and your shelters. My full-time job is no longer managing the shelter programs at APA. Now my full-time job is to help you guys save the lives of more cats. So um, that is all thanks to Maddie's fund. It is literally my full-time job to help you all. So if I can help you in any way, I am here, but I'm gonna otherwise turn it over to Natasha. Uh, well, those were uh, some big words to follow there. Um, I learned everything I know from both of these ladies here, too, um, between FELV with Dr. Levy and all of my life-saving operations for Monica and cat handling skills, too, which have, have come readily and handy over the years. Um, but yes, so I've been running the FELV program through APA for the last four years or so, three and a half. Um, when I took it over, we were adopting out 106 cats a year, or intaking 106 cats a year, and at our peak, we intaked around 550, 560. So it's grown substantially since then. Um, I can also say we have not declined on a single cat who wasn't terminal or too young to enter the program since um, the inception of, of the program. <laughs> so it can be done, and it should be done, and I hope that it continues to be done. So um, now I think we can open the floor up to any questions anybody might have, unless yep. either of you uh, over here. Uh, turn away from and we are going to ask that you use the mic because they're recording it, and that way other people okay. can hear when it later. You turn away for terminal. What are the guidelines? Correct. So the most common things that we see are uh, non-regenerative FELV-related anemia would be one of them lymphomas, and we also currently, as an organization, aren't treating for FIP, so we wouldn't intake a cat who had FIP, too. Those would be our three main diagnostics. When I'm, Natasha, I'm gonna, I, I'm, we're going to do this the whole time, argue with one another. Um, and Dr. Levy, you may want to throw something in, too. So when Natasha says non-regenerative anemia, you need to quantify that, too, because what we think is anemic, your DVM may not think is anemic. Dr. Levy may have an idea of what we think is anemic. So that, that, that's looking at a quantitative PCV, PEC cell volume. And what, do you want to talk about, one of you want to preface that? And it's also important to make sure that you're aware that just because a cat is anemic does not mean that he is non-regenerative anemic. So touch on that. Did I get that question? We actually just pulled the reports on this a few days ago. Um, in terms of every cat, we had flagged both seniors and FELV cats for anemia at intake. And when we see single digit numbers in, in terms of a PCV, that 100% of the time we aren't able to bring them back. Um, but it, for everything above that, we see 60% save rates end up. So um, it, cats get hemobart and other things that can cause anemia too, even when they are FELV positive. So I really want to emphasize treating the cat and not treating the diagnosis of FELV. Hi, um, I'm a cat coordinator at a rescue in Southern California. And I was wondering your thoughts about trying to convince PetSmart that FIV positive, I'm sorry, yeah, positive cats can be in their adoption centers. Yeah, you want to know how we get around it? We don't test. We, Austin Pets Live, we quit testing for FIV uh, beginning of 2019. 
We sent out um, the same kind of a letter, letter, letter that Dr. Levy had up here on the screen. Um, and I can give you our exact letter if you want to email me. I'll be happy to send it to you. We sent it out to all the private practices in the area saying we're not testing for FIV anymore because FIV is stupid. And you can quote me on that. FIV is stupid. It was a very nice letter that said, Dear Vet, FIV is stupid. We're not spend wasting money on it anymore. If you want to spend your client's money, have at. Um, that's what we did. We quit testing for it in 2019. So now what PetSmart goes and they look at our record, it doesn't say positive and they go, oh, all right, and in cat goes. Um, I don't personally have any hope of trying to convince a giant corporate entity to change their policies. I'm just going to be smarter and work around them. So we did in the new guidelines actually have a paragraph suggesting that there is no reason to not to put positive cats in pet store adoption sites. We specifically were thinking of Petco and PetSmart when we were doing that. We've sent a note uh, with the guidelines to one of the policymakers at PetSmart, and um, you know they've had a shakeup in, the, in their organization, both on the commercial side and in the um, PetSmart charity side. So I don't know if it's really going to be read by anybody influential, but I would suggest that all of you take a copy of the guidelines and highlight the part that says this is not a reason to, uh, to keep cats out of pet store adoption sites. And I think if, if a lot of people are mentioning it and it's backed up by science, hopefully we'll get the attention of somebody to open that up. The other thing I'll mention too, because several people have already asked me this today and you may have gotten this question too, Doc, you can buy just a leukemia test from IDEX. So it's also $11 versus 15. So you don't have to be testing for FIV if you do not want to be. Uh-huh. Saved you all a bunch of money with that little tidbit. Okay, who else? Hi, so I work at a cat sanctuary in New Jersey. We, we are adopting them out. Um, but so we have some leukemia cats and we're hoping to expand and have a leukemia wing um, and make them available for adoption. Um, I did read on the APA website that um, the, you guys adopt them out and then they can, you can treat them medically. Um, so we do, we do some, we call them forever fosters. So they're in their home. We have one leukemia cat there. So um, I guess, can you, I guess, can you explain how that works and how we could, how we could also do that? Like, how you can continue to treat the cat, provide follow-up care? Yeah, and like, and what is, I guess, what is leukemia related yeah, illness? Yeah, we've got a great not? document that I'm happy to share with you. Um, I'm stealing all the things. <laughs> Natasha and I are terrible trying to give a presentation together because we just talk over one another. Um, I've got a great document we can send you. It goes out with all of our leukemia adopters, and it says here's exactly what we will cover and what we will not. Okay. And we are very clear up front with our adopters so that there's not misunderstanding. When cat needs a dental extraction, you need to see your private vet. That's not feeling leukemia rated. And I would rather we clear that up at the point of adoption yeah. than when you're angry about something. So for us, things that we consider feeling leukemia related, URI, diarrhea, lymphoma, anemia, um, but we're very clear about what we will and we will not. And I'm happy to send that with you guys. Oh yeah, that would be great, thank you. Hi, I just wanna ask, I um, purchased the book from Austin Pets Alive. Is this information in there? I would think that it is and that would be helpful. Probably not. <laughs> However, you can go to AmericanPetsAlive.org, and if you go to blog, Natasha and I did a Feeling Leukemia webinar not but a month or two ago, where I think we go on for two hours about all these studies that Dr. Levy touched on um, and, and testing guidelines and all that fun stuff. Um, so that's a webinar that's out there. Um, we've both got more presentations and webinars coming up on Feeling Leukemia, but if you go to AmericanPetsAlive.org, you can find our webinar there, and you'll also be able to contact me, and I can put you in touch with, with the team. Um, and I don't you know. also have uh, your forms and everything online somewhere that people can yeah. access. If, yeah, same thing on AmericanPetsAlive.org. If you go to our resources tab, we've got pages and pages and pages of free documents available for download, SOPs and protocols, and all sorts of fun stuff. But there's always ways to contact us, because like I said, thanks to Maddie's, it is my full-time job, and I get the big bucks to help you all save more cats. So you are not bothering me to email me and ask for help. Okay, I'm scared of these things. Um, so I do mostly advocacy, but I am also, I privately do TNR, I privately do a lot of neonatal fostering and get cats from the community out of the community and into rescues and homes, because uh, we have a, a big problem and not enough resources where I live. Um, 
we have a lot of kittens that we think are dying of FIP, but I don't know how to confirm that. Is there a test? What is the protocol? Um, or am I just missing something with other treatments? I've been doing a lot of the neonatal classes this weekend and have learned a ton and bought the book. Right. So the most common FIP we're going to see is the easiest to diagnose is the effusive version where there's stomachs full of fluid and you can also, there's certain blood markers too that a lot of the times are, are pretty um, indicative, especially in, com in combination with the effusion. Uh, neurological cases and dry cases, those are more likely to be seen in seniors and other cats than tiny kittens, but it's not impossible. Um, there's really no like one true FIP diagnostic. You have to use a combination of different diagnostics. So before I spend $4,000 on trying to treat cat, I want to do all the testing before any of that happens. I have a friend that was actually, her cat was on that, that little graph. Been awesome. Yeah. But that, you know, we're losing kittens like two to five months old. Yeah, I, I, as somebody who did treat their own cat for FIP, um, I adopted him to treat him, and uh, I personally put my money towards buying the drug instead of towards the diagnostics, because you're going to know within a couple days to a couple weeks whether or not it's effective, and that ends up being cheaper than, than paying for the thousands of dollars of diagnostics. I just want to plug Natasha again, too. Natasha is a moderator on FIP Warriors, so if you have questions on FIP, Natasha will be happy to talk after this because I know a ton of questions come in for us for FIP treatment. So um, Natasha knows all about those fun things if we run out of time here, which I know we're going to do. One more on FIP. Is a precursor, before you start seeing some of the, the, the distension or whatnot, diarrhea, is the coronavirus being shed? or could it be shed at any time but not mutated? Yeah, so the coronavirus is uh, very wide. This is feline coronavirus. Has nothing to do with canine coronavirus and nothing to do with the Chinese coronavirus. The cats have had this for many decades and they spread it very easily uh, among cats to cats and stress is one of the thing that ramps up the replication and shedding. And there was a good study done out of California where they just tested the amount of coronavirus shedding in cats at the time of intake. And then a week later, and it was, there was this massive increase in both the number of cats shedding coronavirus and the amount of coronavirus being shed. So one thing when we're talking about, you know, if you're seeing a lot of kittens with FIP, um, I would look at operations and say, are they really in like separate foster homes like they should be rather than gathered together in big populations that you're treating in the shelter? Because that's a, a risk. But that coronavirus that is shed in itself can cause mild URI signs and cause mild diarrhea. But most, so most of the time you're not going to think coronavirus because that's very common findings in shelter cats. And then it, poorly understood, something triggers a mutation in each individual cat that turns it into the FIP virus and makes it very virulent. And we don't understand what that trigger is. Fortunately, at that time, when it becomes the mutated virus, it doesn't shed as much in feces, so it's a little less infectious than it was. But of course, now it's become a fatal virus. And that's when you, depending on what, what the immune reaction of the cat is, it can make the effusive form or the dry form or the neurologic form. Um, Monica also, just to, while we're on the subject of FAP, uh, reminded me to bring up that we are also treating, well, I treated my FLV cat for FIP too, and it was just as effective on him as, as it has been for any other cats. Um, to be fair, he is an adult, and it was the wet version, which is the easiest to treat, but he is now five weeks post-treatment and, and totally 100% fine, um, and in seven weeks will be considered cured. Okay, we're out of time, but by all means, if you have more questions, don't hesitate to stop up here, um, grab a business card from one of us, and we will be happy to get back to you. Thank you all for coming so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, everyone.